Prince Imrahil is often overlooked in Middle-earth histories, but he holds a great significance in Middle-earth. As one of the last true nobles in Gondor, his tale is one of valour, honour and leadership. Let's take a look. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek, where we delve into the Lord of the Rings and Tolkien's vast legendarium, as well as explore other beloved fantasy books and TV shows, such as A Song of Ice and Fire and The Witcher. If that sounds good, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. Prince Imrahil is one of the heroes of the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, some say THE hero, and one of the most memorable characters in The Return of the King, but he doesn't really appear in the films at all, so who was he? Imrahil's lineage dates back to the Faithful, those good Numenorians who managed to escape to the mainland before the destruction of the island continent, and perhaps even to Elendil himself. That would certainly explain why Dol Amroth, where Imrahil's ancestors settled and built their stronghold, was made a principality by new King Elendil. Legends also tell of the princes of Dol Amroth possessing elvish ancestry, which can be traced back to Imrazor, a Numenorian, and Mithrelis, a sylvan elf of Lorien. Their son Galador became the first prince, so a high heritage. Imrahil was born into this legacy after Dol Amroth had stood for thousands of years. He was the son of the ruling Prince Adrahil II and an unknown mother, and spent his formative years growing up on the coast of Gondor under the guidance of his father, no doubt being prepared to rule himself one day. The first we really hear of him during this period, though, was when Imrahil's elder sister, Finduilas, married Denethor II, the ruling steward of Gondor. Their union blessed the world with two exceptional offspring, making Imrahil the esteemed uncle of Boromir and Faramir. However, it was not only Finduilas who experienced the joys of parenthood. Imrahil also married, though again Tolkien doesn't tell us the name of his wife, and they had four children together. Elfir, Chiron, Amrathos and Lothiriel. This period of domestic bliss did not last forever, however. Vinduilas, Imrahil's sister and mother to Boromir and Faramir, died. More sadness followed in the year 3010. Imrahil's father passed away, and Imrahil assumed the role of the ruling prince of Dol Amroth. As far as we can tell, he was a strong and capable leader, and gained the love and respect of his subjects. However, it was during this period of apparent calm that Imrahil would face his greatest challenge, the onset of the War of the Ring. When the War of the Ring began, Gondor was faced with an invasion from Mordor, and Minas Tirith was effectively calling the banners. Not all from the coast could respond as they were under threat themselves from the Corsairs of Umber, but Imrahil nevertheless did, leading a formidable company of swan knights, accompanied by 700 skilled foot soldiers to aid Minas Tirith. Upon his arrival, however, Imrahil encountered a disheartening sight. His brother-in-law Denethor, steward of Gondor, had been consumed by a deep sense of sorrow and hopelessness. The weight of grief over the loss of Finduilis's life years earlier had taken its toll on Denethor, leading him down a dark path of despair. He had come to believe that the fall of Minas Tirith under the forces of Sauron was inevitable within his own lifetime. While Denethor languished in despair and obsessively gazed into the Palantir of Minas Tirith, which only served to increase his fears and despair, Prince Imrahil dedicated himself to the city's defence. Imrahil's unwavering commitment to the defence of the city provided much-needed reassurance to its inhabitants, who looked to him as a steadfast leader. While Denethor's spirit faltered, Prince Imrahil stood tall, inspiring hope within the walls of Minas Tirith. Though we don't have a full physical description of him, he seems to have been an impressive figure, with more than a hint of the elf to him. When Legolas sees him, he remarks that here indeed was one who had elven blood in his veins. And if Gondor has such men still in these days of fading, great must have been its glory in the days of its rising. In this, he is actually very similar to Denethor, who was described as kingly, beautiful and powerful, a figure to be followed. But by the time Imrahil reached Minas Tirith, Denethor had received news of Boromir's death and his gloom deepened. Faramir had lost a beloved brother and Imrahil a nephew, the first son of the sister he lost. 
Both will have been grieving deeply during the time we meet them in The Lord of the Rings, but both seem to focus that on the task at hand rather than descending further and further as Denethor did. It was during the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, just days after Imrahil had arrived at Minas Tirith and its aftermath, that we see the true character of Imrahil. First, Sauron's army unleashed a devastating assault on Osciliath, where Faramir was stationed. Faramir, compelled by the dire circumstances, was forced to retreat to the safety of the Causeway Forts, relinquishing control of Osciliath, and then an ordered retreat to Minas Tirith. His small company would surely have died, but for a sortie led by Gandalf and Prince Imrahil. Faramir was sorely wounded and incapacitated by the Black Breath, but just alive. Imrahil, on the battlefield, drew forth an arrow from Faramir and staunched the wound, quite literally saving his life, then personally delivered him to his father. He said, "'Your son has returned, Lord, after great deeds,' and he told all that he had seen. Denethor said nothing in response, and if we pause at that moment— it is tragic and majestic at the same time. Imrahil, perhaps better than anyone else, knew of Denethor's attitude towards his younger son. From Denethor's perspective, Faramir had been tasked with defending Osgiliath and had failed, and now he had been brought back near dead after losing the battle, having to be rescued by more experienced soldiers. All of Denethor's prejudices against Faramir were being proven true. But Imrahil makes a point of emphasising Faramir's great deeds, not his failures. A good uncle. When the battle itself finally dawned, Imrahil and his men were stationed inside Minas Tirith, ready for the siege. But when things changed with the arrival of the Rohirrim, he led a sortie out of the safety of the city walls to aid the riders of Rohan, who had come to Gondor's aid. It was his idea. The battle was still raging, and Minas Tirith was still clearly the safest place to be, but Imrahil led the van of Gondor's forces into the battlefield. He found Theoden dead, and wept for him, though he did not know him. Then he was the first to see that Eowyn was not dead, as everyone thought, just stricken with the black breath and in urgent need of medical care. He sent someone back to the city to get aid, then mounted his horse and focused again on the battle. From there, he saved Eomer, the new king of Rohan, who had been having a bit of trouble with the Mumakil, the Oliphants. Then he headed off to push back still more of the enemy's troops. Somehow, he survived the battle unscathed. At which point, we should probably just acknowledge that Imrahil has so far saved Faramir and his men, and Eomer and his men, and fought off still more orcs and Valiags. He took the time in the heat of the battle to pay his respects to the deceased Theoden, and his swift actions probably saved Eowyn's life as well. It's a shame that Imrahil wasn't really included in Peter Jackson's films, because he was pretty much the hero of that battle. Then, when the day was won, he rode back to Minas Tirith with Eomer and Aragorn, the uncrowned king of Gondor. He is very much an equal partner here. This is what we read. Aragorn and Eomer and Imrahil rode back towards the gate of the city, and they were now weary beyond joy or sorrow. These three were unscathed, for such was their fortune and the skill and might of their arms, and few indeed had dared to abide them or the look on their faces in the hour of their wrath. Perhaps what is most important here is what Imrahil doesn't do next. The three soon discover that Denethor is dead and Faramir obviously still incapacitated. Imrahil was next in line of power. He was now a hero of the battle, and the people evidently loved him, but his first thought was not about taking power, but how best to hand that power on to Aragorn. On learning of the death of Denethor and Theoden on the same day, he says, So victory is shorn of gladness, and it is bitter bought, if both Gondor and Rohan are in one day bereft of their lords. Eomer rules the Rohirrim. Who shall rule the city, meanwhile? Shall we not send now for the Lord Aragorn? Aragorn says no, it isn't yet his time. Legally, Imrahil is acting steward now, but Aragorn advises Imrahil that perhaps Gandalf should be placed in charge, and they agreed on that. It's a simple phrase, and they agreed on that, but it's important, and tells us even more about Imrahil's character. He was a great man, a hero of battle, and someone that people followed, 
but he did not seek power. During the debate of the Captains of the West, Gandalf proposed that they march to the Black Gate of Mordor to distract Sauron's attention from Frodo the Ringbearer. Imrahil said that he would follow his liege Aragorn, despite his clear reservations about the plan. But since Minas Tirith was under his command, the prince advised that some should remain to defend the city. He said, For a while I stand in the place of the steward of Gondor, and it is mine to think first of its people. To prudence some heed must still be given, for we must prepare against all chances, good as well as evil. Now, it may well be that we shall triumph, and while there is any hope of this, Gondor must be protected. I would not have us return with victory to a city in ruins and a land ravaged behind us. And yet we learn from the Rohirrim that there is an army still unfought upon our northern flank. He cares about the people under his protection and prioritised their safety. Again, I think this speaks well of Imrahil. He spoke his mind and made his point, but accepted the wisdom of Gandalf and Aragorn. The host of the West left Minas Tirith, bypassing Minas Morgul and marched north. The idea was to keep the Eye of Sauron firmly on this army, while Frodo and Sam worked their way ever closer to Mount Doom. And in this, Imrahil showed his attention to detail. While they marched, the army had been announcing that the Lords of Gondor are come, but he got them to change it to proclaiming the King Elisar. Their plan required Sauron to believe that Aragorn had the One Ring and was challenging him out of arrogance and boastfulness. A boastful king would announce their own name, not just the Lords of Gondor. A small change, but an important one if their ruse were to work. Once they had reached the Black Gate and dealt with the mouth of Sauron, Aragorn's army found itself arrayed against Sauron's hordes of orcs, trolls and mannish allies such as the Easterlings and Haradrim. An exact count is not given of the number of Sauron's forces, and though they numbered in the tens of thousands at least, the army of the West was hugely outnumbered. It's a testament to the faith Aragorn had in Imrahil that he was placed with his troops where the fighting was likely to be fiercest. The battle was short, so we don't hear of any particular deeds within it, but Imrahil survived and was rewarded for his valour afterwards. He also divested himself of power as soon as he could. He had always recognised Aragorn as his king, and as soon as Faramir was able to take up the reins as steward, handed that title back to him as well. Not seeking power for its own sake is always a good sign in Tolkien's world, as is recognising the valour of others. Imrahil had been perhaps the greatest in the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, and yet he chose to honour others, riding with King Theoden's funeral procession all the way back to Edras. There he struck up a friendship with Eomer, the new king. Indeed, their families became joined together in the second year of the new Fourth Age, as Eomer married Prince Imrahil's daughter, Lothiriel. In the post-war era, Prince Imrahil and his nephew Faramir, the new Prince of Athelion, emerged as King Elisar's most trusted commanders. Imrahil assumed an esteemed role within the Great Council of Gondor, lending his wise counsel to the new reign. Despite his many duties to Gondor, Imrahil also continued to fulfil his duties as the Prince of Dol Amroth, his ancestral home, until his passing in the 34th year of the Fourth Age. So, what is Tolkien showing us with the story of Prince Imrahil? That nobility and heroism don't always attract attention and rarely seek power. It is perhaps ironic or fitting, then, that in the Lord of the Rings films his heroic acts are given to others. Gandalf saving Faramir, the army of the dead arriving in time to aid Eomer, and so on. Imrahil went about his business just doing the right thing, not seeking glory. And perhaps we can also see a contrast here to Denethor. Denethor, losing his wife, started his long, dark spiral downwards, and his son's death pushed him to the brink. But let's not forget that Imrahil had also lost loved ones, his sister and nephew. Even in the midst of all that, he still sought to mend family wounds, praising Faramir to Denethor. Imrahil's grief for surely he too grieved for his family, was channelled into doing what was right and protecting others, fighting tooth and nail to defend what he had left. In the end, Denethor fulfilled his own fate, destroying himself in his lack of hope, while Imrahil clung to hope, 
and did great things. If you'd like to see more videos about Tolkien's Legendarium, please click on the link on the left of your screen now. Or to support this channel, you could click on the link on the right of your screen. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.